Professor Hong Wa, who came to us from the University of Hawaii as an assistant professor a few years ago. She is a fellow of the SPIE, an OSA senior member, and um, has been doing a lot of really fascinating work that's gotten a lot of people's interest the last few years. And we're going to hear much about that today. She was a Beckman Fellow and did a postdoc at the University of Central Florida before coming here. So today, Professor Hua, in a 16 to 9 presentation of rendering focus cues in head-mounted displays for virtual and augmented reality. Thank you so much, Charlie, for the introduction. And it's such a great honor to be able to speak at our own college, right? And so before I start, let me start with introducing you my wonderful students. And so the, uh, obviously they are very happy, and I'm very happy too. <laughs> and uh, so but today I won't be able to, to, to present everyone's work, but at least I want to thank everyone for their hard working. And if I did not mention their work, it's not my fault, it's the time. But I do appreciate their hard working, and they are very wonderful students and staff. And so let me also start with like a very brief general introduction about the general research that my group has been working on. So we have been working on three different uh, kind of broad topics. The very first one is relevant to the talk today is we are developing an optical technologies for variable displays from creating unique optical components to building sophisticated optical systems instrumentation to testing the performance of this type of displays and even trying to test the visual perception involved with this type of displays. And, and you will hear a lot more later today. And the second area that we have been working on is uh, endoscopy for minimum invasive surgery. And we have been working with the surgeons to try to develop uh, endoscopes that goes into the, into the body and trying to improve the field of view, improve resolution, and improve uh, spatial awareness uh, for surgery. And so some of the pictures you see, we put the instrument into the poor pics and uh, took pictures of it. And the last but not the least, we are also interested in microscopy, especially 3D microscopy, the, the systems that we develop are capable of creating uh, a, a microscopy imaging capability, doing macro deflectometry, doing optical metrology, doing sur 3D surface reconstruction. And the reason we apply that to endoscopes, to build a live field endoscope that's able to actually create 3D structures of the, the organs as you capture um, the, the inside of the body images and trying to assist the surgery pr procedures. But today I'm going to pick up one particular topic I'm going to talk about uh, and how to, render, how to render correct focusing cues in uh, head-mount displays. And you will see why it's such an important topic. And so to do that, I'll start with the introduction of the general um, areas that have been the problem in this area. And then I'll narrow it down to talk about uh, what is the focusing cue we're talking about and uh, why it's important. And then talk about uh, the different optical methods that can be applied to address this problem. And then uh, finally, I'll uh, do a case study basically focusing on one particular uh, approach that we have been working on recently. So. Many years ago, when I started this type of talk, I will always have to explain what is virtual reality, what is augmented reality. Nowadays, I don't have to see anything because it's the buzz in the business world, right? Everybody knows. And you look at the investment. It just within a year period of time, there is a $2 billion investment into that market segment. And the projection of the revenue, of course, is also huge. By 2020, we are expecting AR is going to generate more than $60 billion revenue. AR, VR generating about $30 billion revenue. And uh, that seems like a very lucrative area to work on, right? And so the, one of the key technology enabling VR and AR is this head-mount displays which I have been working on for over 25 years, and it suddenly become a hot, hot topic. My point here is HMD 
uh, have on display is nothing new. It started in 1965. And now we have tons of investment into the market and we still today if you go to try to ask me to recommend you what is the best VR or AR display you should buy I don't have a recommendation because there is no good ones out there yet there is no absolute good solution out there yet so the question of why it is so difficult it's such an interesting area to work on but what are the challenges so I kind of trying to condense that down to a few things that, that you can take home. So the number one challenge, I believe, is the form factor. So the concept of variable computing is not new. It rooted back to the 1997. This is a, the very first mobile AR system demonstrated by a group at Columbia University. But however, you can see the poor student wear a huge backpack, 10 pounds backpack for the computer, and then have a GPS, have this tracking, and all wired up walking on campus, which is not comfortable, right? So today we are trying to picture how the consumers are going to use that as often, as frequently as we use our smartphones. We are not expecting to wire people like this, right? So of course we want something that you can pack everything down to that very elegant form factor, the eyeglass form factor. You heard that buzzword a lot, smart glasses. But we are tapping the problem for a very long time and we explored the design space and trying to get down to that small form factor which is just really difficult and we have a very small space to work with and we are asking a lot from that small space packaging the number two challenge I think from an optical engineering point of view is we are asking for high resolution imaging with the simple optics because within the space we are trying to package the thing we don't have a lot of space or room to work with so we want things to be simple however we need them to be high resolution and here's what I'm talking about back 25 years ago when I started working on designing VR headsets and I work with the best macro display at that time was 80 micron pixel size so the pixel density is about 300 ppi. And, it, and the size is about 2 inches to work with. Of course, with a 2 inch panel for each eye, you won't get anything as a smart glass. It's a helmet, right? And so nowadays, we try to reduce the size so we get smaller panels, smaller pixels. And today, what we are working with, 6,000 ppi displays. 0.4 inch or even smaller and so it's a 20 plus times improvements on the display resolution and we want the optical system goes even simpler smaller than the helmet optics go something very simple but the typical this type of optical system requires a numerical aperture greater than 0.2 so yeah based technically are asking for a microscopic optics but at that resolution to deliver an, a, a wide field of view microscope system, actually. And so it's a, it's a very difficult problem. So the third problem, it's not often talked, but I think it's going to be a problem we are going to face, which is in, in an AR display, we are trying to render digital contents overlay that onto the real world. And we are able to control pixel by pixel on the digital contents, but we have no control on the real world environments. So when you supervise that, you, don't, you are not able to manipulate the light interaction behavior between the digital light and the real light. The consequences, this is a typical picture we captured from an AR display. We, when we were trying to overlay a, an aircraft, on a piece of white wall, you don't see a very solid aircraft picture. It's floating. And nothing I can block, the, have a mutual occlusion relationship between. And all of us probably know occlusion is one of the important cue that we use on the daily basis as a, as a cue to determine how, whether one object is behind or in front of the other. But when you don't have the capability to render that cue, 
you confused, and it caused perception dis problem. So we have been recently working on trying to find optical solutions to address the occlusion problem, and these are the, some examples that we uh, designed and built. And as you can see, the top one is example where we were trying to put the Bugs Bunny into the real world scene, and you don't really see that very well. Once you do the per pixel occlusion, you can create the mutual occlusion and have interesting uh, interaction between the digital and the real contents. However, as you can see from the left, left picture, that type of sophisticated optical system is not going to give you a variable system. So then come up with an elegant solution to address this problem and, and still maintain a good form factor. I believe it's one of the next challenges to, to work with AR displays. Another one. In the challenge number four, dynamic range. And we all know that AR display are expecting to work inside, outside, and the, re the real world environment has a huge range of dynamic range. And when you don't have the displays, even, even just 2D displays, do not have enough dynamic range. And then when you try to put the, bring the AR display into the real world, you end up having low dynamic range display working with a high dynamic range C. You either get your image washed out and you are not able to see the details and not usable. And we all have the experience to have your cell phone outside cannot read the screen, right? So again, that we started working on that solution space, and this is a, one of the prototypes. Uh, we demonstrated a high dynamic range HMD and being able to see very bright and very dark at the same time. However, from the optical bench prototype, you can tell it's not a simple solution. And if, again, if you're trying to bring this solution into the, the AR display, you need, you need to come up some way to make it simple. The last problem is we are expecting everybody is using that for a few hours a day. And then if it's not comfortable to wear, and if it's cause you a headache, cause you eye fatigue, it's a bad thing to have. But this is one of the biggest problems these days, too. And so there are lots of, there, of course, there are lots of cause to visual discomfort. And one of the key cause that people have identified have something to do with the focusing cue, which is the, the topic that I'm going to talk about today. So in, we, we all know what a focusing cue is for, um, for, the, for the eye. So when you look at, for example, when your eye are looking at objects at different distance, for example, the cube and the, the, the beach ball, and if your eye is focusing on the beach ball, the, uh, naturally, the cube far away would l appear blurry on your retina image, and you know the distance is different. And so when your eyes are focusing on the cube, naturally, the, the beach ball would appear blurry. And this is such a simple thing, right? And so the focus and cube basically have two aspects of it. One is accommodation, which is basically we call a ocular motor cube because of that your eye lens change shape when you accommodate. And associated with that accommodation action is the blurry effects. By, by looking at the picture, how much blurring present in the picture, your eye will, with that blurring cue, stimulate actually your eye to seek for better focus for the contents of interest. And normally, that blurring cue it varies with the distance of the object, right? And associated with the uh, focusing is the virgence. When your eye is looking at objects at different distance, your eye, left eye and right eye is going to change angle, right? That virgence angle is another ocular motor cue that serves as a, a depth cue. And so when we view a natural 3D environment, like uh, in this classroom, or in, in this example, look at the beach ball or the cube, and you saw the virgence depth and the accommodation depth is a coupled action. When your eye converges to a depth, your eye also naturally accommodates to the depth, the depth of interest. If you plot that, so basically the virgence distance versus 
the accommodation distance of your eye versus the virgin's distance follows a straight line, diagonal straight line. And it's a coupled action. You don't, you don't actually realize, but your eye is doing that. But what happens to HMD? So it, no matter how sophisticated the optics are, generally a conventional HMD have some sort of macro display. And then you have an eyepiece. The eyepiece magnifies the macro display and color in the light enters your eye. And your eye sees the image as a, the, the system as a virtual display. The virtual display at a fixed distance away, a meter away or two meters away, but it's at a fixed distance. When your eye is looking at that virtual display, every pixel on that display appears sharp, right? There's no focusing, the blurring cue present there. And so, so when you look at in a binocular HMD, in this case, typically you render left eye image and right eye image separately. And the, the binocular disparity serves as a stimuli, it's a stimulate your left eye and right eye converge at the depth so that the left eye and right eye image would be able to fuse into one single picture. And then in order to see, that's your virgin's depth. And then in order to see the picture, is sharp focus, your eye needs to accommodate onto that fixed distance display. And which is a, 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 like the previous diagram showing you, it's a, the virtual display at some distance away. So when you plot the accommodative distance versus the virgin distance, in this case, your display screen serves as the cue to your eye accommodation. It's a fixed distance. So basically, your eye, basically, as you change the virgin distance, your accommodation distance stays flat. And this problem is known as the virgin's accommodation conflict problem in HMD. And is it important? Yes, it does, because we have done, and people, other people have done enough psychophysical studies to demonstrate that when you have a system that does not render correct this focusing cue, make the virgin's accommodation decoupled, um, and there are artifacts. One thing is you see distorted depth perception. So basically, the 3D word rendered through this type of display appear flat, not as deep. You see when you underestimate the distance. And the most significant problem associated with it is you, and people experience eye fatigue, or you have difficulty fusing the, the pictures of the, 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 the diplopic vision. Um, after a long time, a period of usage, you have degree of oculomotor responses. And there are headache and there are other things. And, this, and when you associate that in an AR application where you see both a truly 3D real environment that has every single cue correct, and then you, in the meantime, you have a computer-generated 3D environment that have those conflicting cues. And it's going to introduce a lot of conflicts cause you uh, not only depth perception problem, but also a more significant eye fatigue problem. So now let me move on to the different optical methods that people try to address this virgin's accommodation mismatch problem in HMD. And in general, the, the the methods that can be generally characterized into three different ways. Here, I want to I want to make a disclaim that I'm not including the holographic display here because we know if you have a truly holographic display and then you can adjust accommodation, that it produces naturally the undivergence accommodation matched 3D. But uh, however, given this context of, of the holographic display migrated into the HMD is a different uh, sophisticated problem. And here I am not including that as one of the methods. And so one of the methods is known as extending, extended depth field displays. And another approach is very focal displays. And the third approach is a head mounted live field display approach. And I'll explain them in a very sim simple way. So first of all, extending the depth of field. The depth of field of a, a, of a display system, in the, in the case of HMD, is basically affected by 
given by this equation. And so in the a pixel on the virtual display, and they will appear when the eye change focus to a different distance rather than the distance of the virtual display. And the amount of blurring is, is generated is determined by the F number of your eye system. So in this case, the FI is the equivalent focal length of your eye. You don't have much to do with it. You cannot change. The C is the retinal blurring criteria, which basically is a photoreceptor size. And then the last parameter in this equation is the diameter of the ray bundles enters your eye, right? So naturally, you can think of is if you reduce the diameter d, reduce the instead of thick ray bundle, you get a very thin pencil ray enters your eye from each pixel. Then the then you have a extended depth field and you basically mitigate the VAC problem by eliminating the need for I have to accommodate, right? So, and of course the simple way is just reducing that, uh, and add a small aperture some way and create a pinhole optics. Of course, we cannot add a small pinhole in front of your eye. Typically, um, what people have worked on is uh, combine that pinhole optics concept with the Maxfield view concept where in you have a point source, for example, a collimated by this condenser lens and illuminating a special light modulator, the macro display. And then the macro display is placed a focal distance away from the eyepiece. And then in this case, you are not imaging the light source at the back of your retina. You are imaging the light source projected right on your the, the entrance pupil, the center of the entrance pupil. So therefore, that allows from each pixel on the macro display, there is only one tiny thin pencil ray enters your eye pupil. And the, 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 clearly, the problem, of course, is you only have one tiny a thin pencil ray from each pixel. Image will appear dim. And then when the, when the numerical aperture for each of the pixels is too small, diffraction is going to dominate. Your special resolution is going to suffer. And, and then and the, the last is uh, the user experience. When, the, that, when you have a tiny mm, pinhole you have to align your eye with, it's not really comfortable to view the display at all. Another way to extend the depth of field, this is known in the imaging uh, area. We all have been working and trying to mm, extend the depth of field of the imaging system. In this case, uh, I use an example that we work on to try to extend the, the depth of field of microscope by engineering the point spread function of the system to make the point spread function invariant as you change the, the focal depth. And in this case, when you, for imaging system, when you make the point spread function invariant by what we did was by inserting a very focal lens and you quickly scan the focus across the focal stack. And then you create a system that have a point spread function. It's, it's not a very. And then after you capture the, the image, you can apply a digital deconvolution to recover the, the large depth image in high resolution. But then recently a group at Stanford applied this concept to HMD by inserting a focus tunable lens into the eyepiece. So therefore, the focus of the, uh, the, the eyepiece is quickly um, varied across a depth range. So the, the consequences, you see, you, you, the gain is you see a point spread function that is independent of where the camera is focusing on, where the, your eye is focusing. The downside is you don't get a very good point spread function. Your point spread function is always poor, just like the imaging case. And for the imaging case, you can apply deconvolution to recover, but for a display, you, your eye does not uh, apply deconvolution. So therefore, what you see is when the demonstrate when the camera is focused on different depth, the image is always equally blurry. Of course, you can treat that the, the, with the, the benefits of um, an eye accommodation response. The second method I listed there is very focal display. So basically, this is also a very simple kind of straightforward solution where instead of having the, the virtual display at a fixed distance, you can track where the eye convergence is. 
basically that's your depth of interest, and then you can somehow manipulate the eyepiece system to make the virtual display appear at the different distance, follow the eye convergence. And so, and, and technically, there are different ways you can do it. One is add an actuator at the back of a macro display and actuate the, adjusting the position of the macro display just like what they demonstrate in this case. And then the, so your display goes in and out, right? And then another way is you can add a motor on the, on the lens and move the lens in and out. And then the other way that we demonstrated a couple years ago was to have a tunable lens built into the, into the um, eyepiece, and then the tunable lens is going to tune the focus of the, um, the eyepiece, and we use an eye tracking system to track where the eye convergence is, and in the meantime, it depends on where your eye is looking at, the system automatically changes the focus to match with it. And of course, in this case, you can only have one correct focus at a time. So here's when I come to the third solution, which is the light field solution. And so in a conventional HMD system, we basically what is displayed on the display is just like a photograph. It just renders a 2D single perspective image of a 3D scene. Seen from a, a single viewpoint, which is your eye position, and at a given time. And that's all just showing on the display. Instead of showing just a 2D perspective projection, you can solve the problem by creating a true 3D light field display. And in this case, light field display renders the 3D scene by rendering the geometrical light rays that apparently emitted by each of the 3D point. So for instance, in order to render this 3D cube, so instead of render a 2D image, I ran trying to create the ray bundles as if they are emitting from a point on that cube. And they each of the ray represent a slightly different view perspective I see a user would see from a particular viewpoint. And so if your eye sees a ray bundle, and so then naturally that ray bundle, if your eye is accommodative, at that distance, then this rebound will come into focus on your retina, create a sharp focus image. And then another point at different depth at the same eye accommodation would appear to be blurry, right? Or another one that in the closer distance also appear blurry. So in this, in this type of display, the key is how do we actually be able to render this type of rays so that you can create the subtle difference. Your eye is able to see the rebundles from different perspective. There are technically, there are two different architecture to implement this type of display. One is you can, you can think about the, this 3D cube is a volume. And if you slice that volume along the Z direction, so basically, I, if I want to render that volume, I have a focal plane or display slice around across the volume. If I have an enough number of slices, right, then when your eye is looking at a particular slice, every, every single point in this case on that slice would appear in sharp focus. And then when you, when a, a, a point rendered at, on a different slice, will appear be blurry. So this actually is known as the multifocal plane display approach, where you basically create the 3D light field by depth slicing. And we have done some work a, a couple years ago, was trying to understand how can we slice the 3D volume efficiently so that we, we can use the minimum number of slices and yet be able to reconstruct a, three, a large depth volume. So we created a mechanism we call depth fusion multifocal plane, where if you have two adjacent focal planes, you can actually modulate the contrast between them to create focal planes in between, instead of slice at every single depth with high resolution, which today's technology does not afford that. So we demonstrated you actually can create a larger depth volume from 30 centimeters to infinity with the six focal planes. 
and demonstrate the system with a high resolution being able to create it at 1.8 arcminutes. The problem with that system is uh, it's huge and it's uh, sophisticated. And there are three key technology that it's difficult to, to manage. One is you need to have a high speed macro display. For instance, in order to render that six focal plane system, we need a macro display is able to have a refresh rate of at least 360 hertz in order to render that three, the six focal plane at flickering free speed. And then you need the adaptive optics to be able to change the speed at that fast. And then you need your graphic system to be able to render at that fast. Another approach is you think about a light array is a, is a array you can define by two planes. Each plane, on one plane you define the 2D position of the array, on another plane you define the 2D direction of the array. So this basically is a concept of 4D light field representation of, a, of, of the light field. So in this case, in order to render this cube, instead of slice them volume, volumetrically, now I'm going to try to render the rays by angularly sample the rays. Go slower. So in this case, the ray, for example, I'm rendering the, the blue rays one by one, somehow. And then w when the rays are rendered correctly, when your eyes accommodate at a different distance, then you, at the, the correct distance, that, that focus should appear to be at the correct focus, and other, other ray bundles will appear blurry. So the mechanism that being able to render this type of system, there are two different mechanisms. One is using lens lid array, and this is known as the integral imaging, and it was a concept proposed back to 1908-ish. But we recently applied this approach to um, the HMD system, and now that's what I'm going to focus on today. And then the second approach is instead of having a lens, uh, having a macro display and a lens array trying to render the, the different redirections, sample the angles, you can use multiple layers of special light modulator. Each pair of pixels defines a redirection. And of course, that's in that case, it's a lens laser configuration and you have, um, you need to um, computationally generate the modulation layers, factor the light field into the limited number of um, modulation layers. And so in summary, among the different optical approaches that I, I explained so far, the maximum view display of the accommodation environment does not really create a focusing cue. It's trying to mitigate the, the virgin's accommodation conflict problem by eliminating the need for your eye to accommodate. So your basic, your eye is free to accommodate and at anywhere you see the display quality does not change. That's basically the idea. So the very focal display is simple enough that allows you to change the focus, adapt your focus to different distance, but you can only generate correct focus for a given distance at one at a time. And the live field approach obviously is trying to generate the, the correct focusing cue no matter where your eye is looking at. So, and of course, it's a much complex and a sophisticated solution to deal with. So now I'm going to show you some example of what we have done recently with the Hadman live field display using the integral imaging approach. So earlier I said there are basically three different optic or optical architecture to allow you to render live field. The multifocal plane, which I talked about earlier, and the integral imaging and the multi-layer computational live field display. And the one that I'm focusing on is this one. So before I start to show you some of the prototypes that, that we built, I want to now start to talk about and the image formation process with the live field display and how, what type of characteristics this type of display have and what are problems that we need to deal with, basically. So even though there are different optics architecture that allows you to render 
light field display. In general, they all goes back to the 4D light field representation. So you basically, you can simplify that image formation process into, basically, in this simple diagram. You, the light field engine basically generates the light field, and the eye model, the eye sees the light field. And we want to quantify what the retinal image look like when the eye accommodate at a different distance. So in the light field generation engine, in a 4D representation, you need two, uh, two planes. One is the rendering plane. That you can think of that is the image source that typically renders an array of 2D images representing the positional information of the light field. And then you have this modulation plane, which basically could it be a pixel array, could it be a pinhole array, could it be a lens lid array, or something more sophisticated. But it basically defines the directional information of the light field. So each pixel on the rendering plane create a unique perspective for the light field and propagate through the modulation plane and then another key component in the system is the central depth plane. What the central depth plane means is basically is a, um, we use it as a reference plane. And it's the optical conjugates of the render, rendering plane through the modulation plane. In the case, if this is a lens lid array, so then this will be the optical conjugates of the rendering plane. And so each pixel on the rendering plane would form another image on the rendering, on the uh, central depth plane. And usually on that plane, that's where you get the highest spatial resolution. And then the next one is the reconstruction plane. That is the depth that you basically represent the depth location where the point of interest or where the point you're trying to recreate through the light field. So in this case, the point P is away from the central depth plane. And you can see when the four elemental images of the four elemental views propagate through the central depth plane, and then they converge to the point of P of reconstruction. And then each of the elemental view continue propagate, and then you see the view windows. That's basically where your eye is supposed to locate it to view the live view display. And normally we put the entrance people of your eye at the view window, and then you have an eye model to see the display. And then you, you can see each elemental view would project into a small circle on your eye pupil. So in this case, to be a live view display, you need to M multiple different views enter your eye pupil at the same time, right? So then, the, when they project it onto the elemental view, if your eye happens to be accommodated at the depth of the reconstruction P, then the, in the, all the four separate pixels will converge to an overlap on your retina and create one single sharp pixel. And if your eye happens to accommodate in front of the construction plane or behind the con reconstruction plane, the, the multiple elemental pixels are going to be separated on your, retinal, on your retina and create a retinal blur. And so then that amount of blur depends on how far the accommodation is shifted away from the depth of reconstruction. So that's the basic concept. So the key is whether this type of display can actually drive your eye to accommodate at the right depth that you're trying to render. So in order to characterize the image formation process, and you can, we basically use the, the perceived light field. We, we calculate the perceived light field to use the accumulated point spread function. The accumulated point spread function here basically is the integration of the individual elemental images point spread function at the back of the retina. So what you see here is the, this one L, M, so assuming you have M by N elemental views enter the eye pupil, and so then you integrate the the luminous, the intensity of each individual pixel for a given pixel index as MA. And then you also considering the wavelength, the, the, the weighting function for the different 
mm, pixel channel, the red, green, blue, or depends on how many wavelengths you sample, and there's a different weighting function. And then we also consider the different elemental view enters the eye at a different position. And there, the star's crawfold effect is also plays a role here. So that therefore, depending on the entry position of each view, and then we apply a different weighting function, apodization function. And then the key finally is this mm, point spread function of each elemental image. So the point spread function of each um, elemental image, basically each pixel on your rendering plane propagate all the way through the system ends up on your retina and uh, creates a point spread function. And that point spread function is depending on a few different things. And so one thing I want to emphasize here, I want to explain before I explain the, the relationship is on the view window, how many views enters your eye and create that integral image is important. So we define that characterized user parameter called view density. Basically, the number of views per unit area is the definition of view density. And so if the, each element of view projected into a small area, and we calculate the number of views by multiply the view density with the area of the eye pupil. And that's the number of views you are going to integrate to create that accumulated point spread function. And the, the view density, the higher the view density, the smaller the footprint of each elemental image is, right? So then the numerical aperture of each elemental view is, would be small. And the smaller that numerical aperture, the higher diffraction problem kicks in, right? So then it's not always the, the more views, the better. And you will see that in a minute. So then in general, basically, the each element of view, the point spread function, is going to depend on where the central depth plane is located relative to where your eye is looking at. So we use a Z or the CDP as a measure. And then it depends on the view density of the light field sampling, how many angles you sample and in how dense you sample, basically. And then the other is the axial displacement of the reconstruction depth. Um, I mentioned earlier, when the reconstruction plane coincides with the central depth plane, you have the highest spatial resolution. As the reconstruction plane is shifted away from the central depth plane, and the, each of the pixel propagates is going to create a defocusing blur. The further away you have, the larger the defocusing blurring you have. So therefore, you expect to see a degradation of the, the image. And then finally, it, it depends on the eye pupil diameter, of course, it's because it, how many views you can integrate within a given area. And it depends on where your eyes accommodate at. So I'm not going to go through that math, but I'm going to show you uh, some of the interesting results. So the first thing we look at is uh, the effects of the view sampling on the spatial resolution. And so the, the first thing we look at is on the, on the central depth plane, on the CDP, where you're supposed to get the highest spatial resolution. And so what do you see here are the modulation transfer function of the retinal image at a different view sampling density. And the blue curve is a one by one view. Basically, it's a simulation for a 2D display. You only have one view seen by the eye pupil. Versus the red curve is two by two views, and three by three views, and four by four views. As you can see, the higher the view density, and the smaller the cutoff frequency you see. And then, of course, the lower the modulation transfer function, your image contrast and the spatial resolution is reduced. This is mostly due to the diffraction effects. That's not surprising. The second thing is how quickly does the image degrade or drop as your reconstruction depth is shifted away from your CDP. So, the, so basically because as the reconstruction depth is shifted away from the CDP and the defocus effect is going to play a role and therefore you expect to see their spatial resolution degrade and that's the reason that limits the, the, the depth field of the light field display. And in the left, what you see is this is assuming a two by two view uh, light field display and simulated for the reconstruction depth at a different 
distance. Zero means right on the CDP. 0.3 means 0.3 diopter away from the CDP. 0.6 diopter away from the CDP. 0.9. As you can see, as you, the reconstruction position is shifted away from the CDP, you see a quickly dropped spatial resolution. And this is an image to show the, in the, in the effect. As you can see, on the CDP, you can see the smallest letter in sharp focus, but when at a 0.9 diopter shifted away, you, you start to lose the resolution for the small letters. And so we use that as a way to define, mm, and define the, the, the resolution limits. And if we define the, the, the minimum contrast for your image needs to be at least 10%. And then we define the cutoff frequency for the light field rendering that defines the light field. This, what you see here is the cutoff frequency as a function of the view density, again. So basically, the take home message is the higher the view density, the slower that resolution degradation and to be you seem to get a larger depth of field, of course, at a reduced overall resolution. The other aspects we want to look at is uh, the focusing cue rendered by the live field display. And uh, can we actually render accurate focusing cue by those angular samples by integ integrally uh, generating the, angle, the angular samples of the live fields? So in general, the focusing cue created by live field display have two components. One is the distance cue, which basically is by given because your reconstruction depth defines where the distance you want to render. And that's, a, that's a, a defined in your, in your rendering process. And then the second is the blur cue. And so basically that is rendered by the retinal image. And in this case, actually, your, your distance cue is always correct. Your blur cue is going to be the one simulating your eye to change accommodation to maximize the retinal image sharpness. And in this case, retinal blurring cue is the true stimuli, is the only stimuli that can stimulate your eye to, to perform accommodation change. And we first look at how does your eye actually respond to this type of display. And what you are saying here is that this is assuming we have a, um, the integral imaging system with the central depth plane set at uh, one diopter away, one meter away, and rendered by a two by two uh, elemental views. And when what the first plot shows you the modulation transfer function of the image contrast change as a function of the eye accommodation change through the space. So zero means the eye is accommodated right on the, on the, mm, the reconstruction plane. And then a negative shift means the eye is shifting toward the CDP and then to, closer to than the reconstruction depth. And a positive shift means it's shifted further away than the reconstruction depth. And so the, the, the three plots, A and B, C, basically were given for when the reconstruction is on the CDP versus the 0.5 diopters and a one diopter away. As you can see, the black arrows basically marks where your eye sees the highest image contrast. And as you can see, for the different spatial frequency, as the reconstruction depth is shifted away, from the CDP, you start to see your eye don't see the, the, the highest or the sharpest image when the eye is focused on the reconstruction, but it's actually it's toward the CDP where the, the actual image information was rendered, which also makes sense. And then you start to see a balance of it. The last plot is to show how the eye responds to a real world environment. This is ideal if your live field display is rendering correctly the focus and cue. You should see them at a different spatial frequency. You always find the sharpest image at the position of the object or, or at the position of the rendering. And so that gives you basically the amount of the how far the black arrow shift away from the reconstruction gives you a measure of accommodation errors. 
uh, for this type of display. And in general, they are the, the plots on the, on the right side basically plot the accommodation error as a function of the distance of reconstruction. And the general message is if the accommodation error, you have accommodation error if this black arrow is shifted away. And if you have different, uh, at a different spatial frequencies, as you can see, the, in this case, the low frequency tend to have more an accommodation errors than the high frequency information. Of course, the high frequency in, in this case also have very low, in, uh, uh, very low image contrast. In general, it's the, mi it's the middle frequency is driving the eye accommodation. So then we, when we look at the view density as a function of the accommodation error, we choose a middle frequency like a, a 10 to 15 cycles per degree as a reference frequency. And what you see here in the plot is showing you the function of the modulation transfer function of the eye accommodation response as a function of the, the view density. So basically, the more views that you render, the better the accommodation accuracy is. And in this case, this is when the reconstruction is on the CDP. This is one doctor away. And even in this case, with the 4 by 4 views, you can still, uh, one doctor away, your eye still can find the correct focus at the, the accommodation error is still zero. But however, when you compare them all views, 4x4 four four view versus 2x2 two two view, when you have 2x2 two two views, you see image have a higher contrast. When you have 4x4 four four views, your image has a lower contrast. So it's a trade-off between the image quality and accommodation error. So with this generalized study, we start to build prototypes to demonstrate what we can do. So the, the very first prototype that we, we demonstrated was a, a couple years ago. This is a, taking the simple concept that you have a macro display in combination with a lens lid array that creates a small um, 3D light field um, source. And then that 3D light field source is coupled into a freeform eyepiece. And your eye sees a magnified light field display. And so then, they in that system, and you can see the bench prototype. Actually, these are three and D. Just so you know, that's actually floating in space. That's the light field generated by the lens light array structure before and coupled into the eyepiece. And so, what we were expecting in that simple structure was we expect the CDP in that demo system was set at one after away. And uh, as the model earlier pr um, predicted, we anticipate to see the image quality quickly degrade as the, the depth of reconstruction is shifted away from the CDP. Ex ex anticipate to see about 2.7 archiminutes on the CDP. At a zero diopter, it's about 10 archiminutes. And at the three diopter, it's about 25 archiminutes. These are the predictions from the model. And so this is our, some experimental results you see. And so the, these sets of pictures were the 3 and D are two letters generated in the 3D space. 3 was generated at 4 meters away. And D was generated for 30 centimeters away. And so the Snelling chart in the lab was roughly about at 4 meters away at the same distance. And this resolution target was at the same depth as the D. And then we put some strokes on the letter to, to simulate the Snelling letter strokes. So in this case, the letter gaps were similar to the biggest, largest letter. So you can see at four meters away, when the camera was focusing on the three, and the elemental images like rendered in this way, were able to converge and create a three at the correct distance. And the resolution similar to the Snelling chart, in this case, the largest E was about 15 archiminutes. And the, the D in this case, you can see was blurring. That was a natural, um, the, the retinal blurring you could expect to see. And then when the camera is shifting focus to the D, then the, the closer object, then the D is in focus, the three is blurry. And this is a slight perspective change to, in this case, we have roughly about two to three views in the size of the eye pupil. So 
At that time, the, the biggest problem that we face is, number one, spatial resolution. We are not getting much resolution as we predicted, and that's a natural thing for life field display. And so you can see this, this small letter is roughly about the size of this line. And if, at four meters away, you start to see image blurry. And then we are not able to generate anything better. And the other thing was the crosstalk. So the elemental image seen from one lens lid is going to be seen from another lens lid in the neighboring lens lid. And creating in the eye, in the eye view window, when you then you start to see not only in this case the 3D, this is the contents, but then you see other artifacts in your picture. And that's not something you want to have unless you reduce the aperture to really small, which we, we don't want that either. So in order to address that problem, and we start to think about what can we do with it. So we built this is a simple illustration of the schematics here. So we, in order to address the crosstalk problem, we start to insert another pinhole array between the elemental image, which is the, lens, the macro display, and the lens lid array to, if we choose the optimal position of the pinhole and then this aperture array with the right size and right position, we can block those crosstalks, hopefully. And then after we create that light field engine, this is basically the front end of it. And the problem, the, the last demonstration was when you have a fixed CDP, you can only render high resolution on the CDP. And then away from the CDP, uh, you have a very shallow depth field. And then your resolution drops too quickly. So then we, in the system, we start to say, if we add a tunable optics, we are able to tune the, the, the position of the CDP some way. And then we add the IP, so and then we would be able to naturally solve this problem, right? So the, one of the, the, the first bench prototype we built um, was to try to prove whether the pinhole array was able to actually clear up the image. And it, it clearly that uh, if you put the, have the right size of pinhole aperture at the right position, and then you basically make the image clear in the view window. So basically resolve the crosstalk problem. It's a simple solution, but uh, it's quite efficient. And then the other thing is in the system, we put a tunable lens in the, in the bench prototype. And so in order to demonstrate that, what we do was there are four resolution targets generated at a different distance. And the number in, in the middle shows their depth. So zero means they are far away, zero diopter, infinity. One means at one diopter, two means at two diopter, three means at three diopter. So the target were rendered at different depth. This is if you have a fixed depth. And when the, the, the system only has the CDP at one diopter, then you see the one diopter target has the highest resolution. Then the three diopter ones, the image you don't see much at all here. And once you are able to tune the, the CDP, you are able to, for each of the, the depth, you are able to get a sharp image. This is like the concept of the very focal display, except this is applied to the light field. We are tuning the CDP of the light field display. And that was encouraging. So then we decided to build a sophisticated prototype to demonstrate this. And so we build a, we designed a freeform eyepiece and then have in combined with the, so the first unit part of unit was the elemental image light field generation engine that has this aperture array. And then that generate the intermediate light field and it is have a tunable lens, create a relay group that allows us to be able to tune the CDP. And then in combination with this freeform eyepiece and, and with a, a character, we create a AR display, a see-through display. And so the system now is kind of compact enough compared to the multifocal light field we have occupied a big volume. Now it's actually variable now. 
Um, so this is a, a 3D model of that system. This is a monocular assembly. This is a binocular. I'll show you a video just in a minute. I want to explain to you what you will see in the video. So in order to show the function of the system, so we create a target. So the target has three depth planes. So basically, the number 0.5D means that the target was located two meters away. And the 1D means at one meter away, and the 3D and the three diopter, 30 centimeter away. So the three different depth. And so those are the elemental images rendered. So basically, in the configuration, we each elemental image have about 125 by 125 pixels. They were created by an array of 17 by 15 um, image array of those elemental image. Mosaic in together, this is a mosaic of that image into the, the full size display. And as you can see, this is one of the elemental image blowed up, so you can see them. And this is another one showing the 1D. And then in the demonstration, we also put a three target at the same depth, the, 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 the three, the three diopter, one diopter, 0.5 diopter for, the, uh, for reference. And in, the, this, in this picture, it's a fixed CDP. The CDP was fixed at a one diopter to show you the effects of the resolution de degeneration. So when the image was focused, the camera was focused on one diopter, that's your back to focus position. And then 0.5 diopter, 3 diopter, you can see the very quickly not even close to that resolution, right? I want to point out here, though, the smallest letter here is a 3 Archimedes. The median size is 6 Archimedes. The larger size is 10 Archimedes, just for your reference. And so then the, the other mode we are demonstrating in that video is a very, very depth in the CDP mode where the CDP is tuned to one depth at a time. So basically what you will see is when the CDP is tuned to the three diopter distance, you get the reconstruction at a high resolution as good as the one diopter you saw earlier. And then of course, when the, in this case, the 0.5 diopter would be really blurred. And then the, in this case, when the CDP is at three diopter, even your, your camera is focusing at 0.5 diopter, the image would be blurry because uh, there is a larger separation from your reconstruction depth to the CDP, right? And so then the next mode you are going to see is the uh, dual depth, the dual CDP mode, where actually we generate a similar to the multifocal plane, except this is applied to the light field, where you actually times the mar multiplex in two CDP. Um, and together, and so when the camera is focusing on the 0.5 diopter, th so in this case, nothing changed in the contents. The point, when camera is focusing on the 0.5 diopter, you see the equivalent high resolution image. Uh, when the camera switch to 0.3D, uh, the 3.5 diopter, you also see high resolution image. This is because the, it, this is volumely rendered for um, a large depth range. So now let me switch to the video because I couldn't play them. Yeah, the layout I already explained and you saw that. And so they, and here's the 3D model of the system. You will be able to see the whole mm, system up and down. And here is the, the two, two relay group, and this is the freeform eyepiece. And you will see a whole picture, the video of the prototype set up on the bench. And this was the camera placed at the view window position to capture the, the videos you will see. So the first mode is the fixed CDP case. It started with, with the CDP set at one diopter. And you can see as the camera is switching focus, in that case, the, the three diopter target, even the converge, created the correct and uh, the 3D contents, but resolution was lower. And then the, this is um, the when the camera was uh, focusing on the switching focus uh, across to show you a few times. 
And then this is a very CDP mode. We started with the CDP set up with a 0.5 adopter. And the camera, when the camera is focusing here, you can see what I said. Even though when camera is focusing at the right, they target the elemental image converge, but it was lower resolution. And you get the best resolution at 0.5 adopter. Yes? Uh, which one? Uh, the 3D. And the 3D. In this case, because of the separation of the um, the CDP in and the reconstruction depth was too large, and so uh, some of the elemental images do not converge properly. And so if you if you look carefully, for example, the one diopter one, they all converge because the one diopter the distance away from the 0.5 diopter is smaller. It's only one meter difference. In this case, it's like almost a three meter difference. You, you, you can, if I pause for a second here, when the camera, for example, in this case, was trying to focus on the, the three diopter target. They are kind of converging, but blurry. Versus if you try to see the the one doctor case, uh, let's see if I can. The one doctor one get a sharper focus, even though the reconstruction depth was away from the CDP. So in this case, because the CDP was um, at the two meter distance, you get the best image over here. And the other, this is an, uh, like a blurry. In in this case, the elemental image do not converge at all, and then, so you see the separate letters. So this is the one you set up the CDP at a three adopter. Now you will see you get the sharpest image for this target. And then you see blurry when the camera is focusing on this target now. It's, it, even though the camera was focusing on that one, that one, one was blurry. And so now this is switched to the multiple CDP case. And so they, the two CDP were rendered at a 3 adopter and a 0.5 adopter. And you can see when the camera is switching focus now, switch and focus on the 3D, all the 0.5D, at both depths you can see high resolution rendering. And the last one, my student really likes to show uh, the Einstein. So <laughs> and so the, again, the, this was like a rendered with a two depth. And the, the uh, one CDP had two diopter, one CDP had 0.5 diopter. The Einstein was a, a three diopter, um, a two diopter, one diopter, and a 0.5 diopter. So you can see when the camera is switching focus, the the model, the Einstein model is uh, changing the blurry. So w in the case of the letter, because of the, the snelling letters really shows the sharp details, you can see the elemental image becoming separated and it is, the artifacts is noticeable. But in the case of it's a, in a, in a, a continuous image, I want to show you that one last you don't really see the separated elemental images start to give you more naturally looking blurry. And part of that is the letters really shows artifacts. Yeah. And so let me go back to. So basically, that's a, the. A, and the end of my presentation. So what I did today, I summarized the different optical methods that you, um, people have explored to address the VAC problem in HMD, trying to create a more comfortable 
AR VR displays, and we demonstrated the live field display that we have been developing recently. And obviously, there there are lots of limitations for that prototype, and we only have about uh, 30 by 18 degrees of field of view, and uh, the resolution is and uh, right now is uh, about one is about three arcminutes. And the depth range is large, as you can see from 3.5 diopter, very close to very far. And especially if we're utilizing the multiple uh, CDP rendering scheme, and we can achieve um, the same resolution across the large depth volume. Of course, that is done by the display only have a refresh rate of um, 60 hertz. When we multiplex two focal planes, two depth planes, with a refresh rate down to 30 frames per second. So we need to get over that. And so the increase in the field of view, improving the resolution, improving the eye box, improving the refresh rate, um, there's a long list of things that are still not quite quite right yet. And then and then, then the other things the system is still not as compact as we and as I said at the beginning, everybody wants to have a pair of smart glass you want to put on. That one only my students are willing to probably <laughs> And so they, then the other things, the, the manufacture challenge, the, the one we deal with, so we are still trying to work on the details of how to um, actually align those small elemental images with the lens layer array, with the aperture array, to eliminate all these artifacts. Those are right now are manually done um, pixel by pixel by the poor students. So it's not an easy process. So. Um, then in the future, we are hoping to work on solutions to improve all of these different aspects I just mentioned. And the one last thing I want to mention, I believe that uh, an area that have been not very uh, highlighted, um, not very much investigated yet, is the human factor issues. And we, we all know that uh, Divergence accommodation is one of the causes to human visual um, perception, cause you eye fatigue, cause those artifacts. But which of the solutions can really address this? I, I believe live field display is one of the solutions, but as you, as you saw from the trade off studies that we have done, it's, and you have to treat off with the, the different facets of the, and the system performance. And, uh, to what extent that is um, is able to address the problem, and it's a open question. So I'm hoping that in the future we can dive into um, those um, human factor studies more. And with that, I want to again thank my students and the collaborators, the funding agencies, and that's uh, that's it. <laughs>